Um, today we're going to be talking about uh, um, searching for nearest neighbors and related problems. So, um, nearest uh, neighbor um, searching. And so this is very uh, related to some problems we talked about um, when we're talking about LSH. And what we're thinking of is that we have n um, data points. And n is extremely large. Um, maybe think like 1 million. Um, so, um, so we talked about before we want to find all pairs of elements which are close to each other. So there are kind of two key um, searching question. So, um, so find all um, um, similar um, uh, um, pairs, right? So, and so if you did this naively, you have to check all pairs, and you don't want to check all pairs. You somehow want to kind of push the ones which are similar together. And we had this technique. Uh, we talked about this. Um, locality sense of happening. And we're able to get this to be closer to something, uh, uh, um, so it's closer to linear. We did a, a constant amount of work per, per item to try and find the close pairs. Um, so I, I'm not going to claim it actually is fully linear. You need some dependence on the number um, more than linear, but it's, it reduces better than n squared. Um, the, the other interesting question is um, given uh, um, a query point Q um, um, find um, say phi of this set let's call this set of points P so phi of P of Q which is going to be um, R min of P and P of the distance between P and Q. So um, if you haven't seen this before, so the, the, probably everyone's seen before when it says min, min of this item, it finds the actual distance value, which is the, the minimal distance, but the argument gives you the argument that minimizes it. So this means the point which minimizes um, this distance. So this is, we want to find the point which minimizes the distance to our query. Right, so if you think you have a bunch of input points, and so then this is your input uh, P, and then you're going to have some, some query point Q, and you want to find the point which is closest. So if you can think of if you drew a ball, a metric ball around this point, and it contains just this point, then that point must be the closest point. So we want to find this, uh, find this quickly. And again, now instead of checking all pairs, what we want to be is we want to do better than checking all distances. So a million is still a lot. If we, this is a, something that we don't just do once. We're going to make multiple of these queries. We're going to have a lot of these queries, and we want each of them to be quick. So we're going to spend some time to pre-process this data set into some sort of data structure, which allows us to answer this question quickly. Um, there's another kind of uh, related question, which you may say, um, 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 find all um, P and P's such that um, D of P Q is less than R. Right? So we're finding all the points within some radius. Right, so if, if our radius was, was this, this was our distance, then we would, it would just be this point and the queries return the same thing. Right? But you could also have a smaller radius where the, re, where the answer is, is nothing. Or you can have some sort of um, larger radius where you return these two points. Um, and, and, and also this third point. So you return all the points which are inside of here. Um, so, um, so, so if you're answering 
this, this second question, um, then what we talked about with uh, um, locality sense of hashing can work pretty uh, well for this in, in certain situations. It's actually better tuned for finding all of them within a radius than it is to do finding the nearest ones. Um, remember, locality sense of hashing had something like the what you did is you set up some something you could write the distance on the bottom, or you could write this similarity, and this is the probability um, that we check this distance. And so the smaller the distance, the larger the probability. And we tried to set it up so there's some threshold where we have a high probability of checking things that are below this distance and a low probability of checking beyond this distance. And maybe there was like two thresholds. So we said this was low and this was high. There are some no man's land in between. Um, but if you want to find just the nearest point, the problem is ahead of time, you don't know what the threshold should be. So you have to check a bunch of these different thresholds. Um, and so it's not quite tuned um, for the right thing. Um, so we'll talk about some other techniques that are better for finding just the nearest neighbor. So this point here, this description is called the um, nearest um, neighbor neighbor of a cube. Um, so just to be clear, if we're if we're running LSH and we just want to find the nearest neighbor and we or we want to find all points inside of some threshold. And so we set you know, the threshold to be something like here, and we're allowed some slack. So we don't care about all the ones right by the boundary, but if it's well inside, we want to check. So, so, so how would we, how can we do, answer this quickly with, uh, with locality sense of caching? Given, say we're given a million points, and now we are told we want to answer this query quickly. Um, um, how do we do it in less than, without processing a linear amount, you know, some some amount of time for each data point. How can we do that? So, so, so you hash Q, right, the query point. Okay, good. But how do we know which bin it's in? So we have to do something to all of these points, right? So, I mean, the, the key here is pre-processing. So, so this whole procedure has two kind of main steps that, that you, have, you have to keep in mind. You, you, you step one where you pre-process, and with locality sense of hashing, what you do is you hash all p in p, and this takes you know um, linear time. And at this point, I haven't been given the query yet. I'm going to say if I have to, if I don't have a chance to pre-process, then I can't do better than just checking all the distances. But if I pre-process first, now you know I'm I'm a uh, so, so so for instance, if you're if you're given data set ahead of time, and then you say sometime next week someone's going to ask you a bunch of questions, you know which which point is closest. You have some time to organize your yourself so you can answer these quickly, right? So if you have so if I was smart when I was handing back the papers, right, I, I knew a bunch of you were going to say, do you have, you know, um, my, my paper and, you know, what's, you know, if you tell me your name, I want to quickly look it up. Well, I hadn't pre-processed these, so I had to look through all of them, right, to find yours. But if I had sorted them alphabetically, then I could pretty quickly figure out, you know, um, which, which assignment was yours. Um, so, so, so I could have done that in my office and then not have to check linearly through all of them, right? So, so this is, you know, simple if you're just sorting elements in one dimension, but in higher dimensions, this is more, more, more tricky, right? So with locality sense of hashing, you hash all of them and then, you know, then on <coughs> query Q, you 
hash q and check which p and p are in the same you know bins, right? So. So if you spend time ahead of time, then you can answer this query quickly, but you can answer lots of queries quickly, right? So, you, so this, this operation is much faster. Um, okay, so, but this locality sense of hashing, you know, doesn't have great guarantees. You have to spend a lot of, a lot of these hashes in, a, in, order, in order to do this quickly. And so, especially if you are in just um, if you're just in one dimension, then really what you want to do is just sort sort the data points, right? If I just have names alphabetically, I just sort them by name, and I can look up and log in time with the um, with the binary search tree, right? So so that's simple. But in in higher dimensions, this is a little uh, more challenging, right? So wouldn't it be expensive to pre-process? Like if you do normal sorting, it would take you in log in. But yeah. if it's in higher dimensions, it might be more expensive than in log n. Well, so how do you sort in higher dimensions? So if I have these five flat points, how do I sort them? It really depends on what you want to sort it by. Then you go through them and then order them either way you want them. Yeah, but you, you have to know how to sort them. So what people do in, in, in databases with really large data sets is they'll choose some some one dimension which they think kind of a lot of people are gonna is gonna differentiate thing and they'll sort in that dimension and then maybe within at a low enough level they may sort in, in another dimension as well but it's hard to sort in more than one dimension you can only choose one of them okay. um, but there's still other things you can do in in, in 2D um, in two and in low dimensions in low um, dimensions. And by this, I mean d is equal to, say, 2 or 3 and maybe maybe 4 or 5. Sometimes you can get some work with 4 or 5, but you have to be a lot more careful and you have to get lucky, too. Um, but in low dimensions, what you can do is called a um, Voronoi um, um, diagram. So what this is, is that you, you take this set of points, and so I, I want to give it a query, quickly figure out which point is the closest. Well, so what I can do is I can say for any query, let's, let's you know, figure out the regions of here which, which define the closest points. And you can do this by drawing, if, if I just had two points, if I just had these two points, this line separates them. If I have a point on this side, this one is closer. If it's on this side of the blue line, then this point is closer, right? And so I can do this with all of the points. And so, so I get something like that's right. So you get something like this, and then on a query, so if this is my query Q, I know it falls in this region, and so this is the closest point. So you can pre-process this, and you can do this in, in, in high dimensions as well. So yeah. your hash function is dependent to the word that you're drawn? Well, no, I'm, I'm not going to do hash functions anymore. So I'm going to talk about a different approach other than locality so, sense of hash. The first approach when you, use, when you are using hash, how actually, how, how you are sure that the queue will go to the, to the exact bucket that you want to? Um, you're not sure. So with locality sense of hashing, you have this probabilistic error. You're probably, you're, you're not going to get all of them. You're going to get something like some of them are some of the ones which are close. So these which are close, there this is the probability above here that you're not going to find them. 
So in the hash function, you're, you're going to have some error in it. But we'll tell you sense of hashing. With the, with, with the Voronoi yeah. diagram, you have no error. Okay. And you always find the closest point. So now, given the structure, though, this I'm, I'm given these, these line segments, and I've divided up the plane, right? Given a query point, how do I figure out which of the cells I'm, the query point is in? I still need to do that quickly, right? So th there, there are actually techniques how to do this. You kind of um, you kind of look at all these boundary points, and you do this um, uh, what's called a vertical decomposition of through all of these um, through, through all these intersection points, and and then you you find you you look at all the points where these line segments intersect, and then you kind of build a um, like a binary tree based on these uh, these intersection points, um, and so this this uh, query fell in this rightmost binary tree. There should be another one here, and then within the tree, you can also then sort um, vertically as well. And you can you can answer these queries in two D in D equals two in log n time, which is the same as if you're in one dimension. Um, and there are some. This is it takes a little bit of care to implement this. It's harder than just doing you know a binary tree, but you can get this run fairly efficiently. Um, in in 3D, there's some version of this that can run again in basically log n time in theory, but I think in practice it, it doesn't it doesn't work quite so well. And it's much more complicated. It's just in the last um, you know few years as as the theory really kind of found the absolute tightest bounds on, on these sorts of questions. Um, one of the issues why this doesn't work in in high dimensions is that the complexity of the Voronoi diagram, how many line segments and, and intersections and vertices you have, the, um, the complexity, um, which is how, how much space it takes to store this Voronoi diagram in, in, um, in RD is going to be, for n points, is D over, the floor of n over D over 2. Um, so, when, when this equals 2, then this is linear. This is O of n. There's a big, big O here. So there's some constants. But the constants aren't too bad. They're like 3 and 2 dimensions. Um, in, in 3D, this is still, still linear. Yeah? Um, I have two things to say. I think your Roman diagram is incorrect. Every, each, um, every three bisectors should intersect in one point. Okay. Um, um, so, so you won't have three vertical red lines. You will have two. Well, so I've got a, there's an intersection here, here, down here. No, no. Right? Every three bisectors should intersect in one point. But, okay, but if you right. see your three bisectors are intersecting in two points, which is correct. And about the complexity, are you sure that it's floor, not same? I mean, n to the d over 2 floor or n over to the d over 2 set? Actually, I'm remembering from CG that completion geometry. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm hoping I've got it right. It says floor in my notes, but I, I, it's possible I'm wrong. I should know this. I'm a function of geometry guy. But, um, it's, okay, I'm going to,
Okay, I'm not. So it's 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 possible I'm wrong. So I will I will I will check this up. I will check this and look this up in my notes. Um, yeah. Yeah. So it's it's possible it's it's already m squared in three D. Um, Are, are you are you finding something differently? Actually, the complexity of convex hull in this dimension is this one. Yeah, but so the this is right. The complexity of Borman diagram is Borman diagram, right? The oh, complexity yeah. of Borman diagram is. It's the ceiling. It's set. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Because okay, okay, great. Because the the the, con the convex hull is actually like the Borman diagram of one yeah. dimension higher. Okay. <coughs> Um, thanks, me so, so so okay. So so let's let's look at this. So d equals one, two, three, four, five. Then if, if I look at the complexity, it's so it's linear in one dimension. This is just you have the, have the binary tree. The the complexity of a binary tree is linear, right? Um, in in two dimensions, it's also linear. In three dimensions, it's m squared. In four dimensions, it's n squared. In five dimensions, it's n, n to the third. Right. So this is just the complexity of storing it. So if you just wanted to store the structure, you needed um, n squared space. So it means you. So it's it's going to be really expensive if you're if you have a million points, you can't store something that's that's a million squared. So there are data structures where you can find the nearest neighbor in in three dimensions and. Uh, um, in, uh, log in time um, with with some uh, pre-processing, but it's it's you have to play some tricks to get these to work. Um, so th this is a big O, which is the worst case complexity. So you know, uh, so some of you uh, uh, may be rightly kind of um, skeptical if you see something that says a big O. In practice, is this the case? Do I really need, you know, n squared space in order to store this in 3D or in 4D, or in 5D? Do I need n to the third space for this? Um, there's, there's somewhere to suggest that it's some of these things in practice in reasonable data sets, they may be close to linear in three and four dimensions, and in five dimensions, sometimes you can put on do some extra structure where you add in some extra special points and kind of do something like the Bornet diagram, which is again close to linear in practice. Um, but higher than five dimensions, even constructing this is, is not possible. Um, so in, in something close to linear amount of space. So this, this will work in 2D and it starts to break down pretty quickly. Um, but the, this will give you the exact nearest data. Um, OK, so this approach is not going to work very well in um, higher dimensions. OK, so, so the rest of the lecture is going to be talking how do you answer this nearest neighbor question in higher dimensions, or at least do it so it's maybe not the exact one, but an approximate version of this. Because remember again, the distances is a modeling choice, and so if you're off by a little bit of the distance, that shouldn't shouldn't matter too much. Um, but before I do this, I kind of want to take a um, a short kind of break, and some people may be wondering. I'm talking about these high dimensional data points, right? Do these high dimensional data points ever exist? Right? Did you ever actually get these, these high dimensional data points? Right? So most data you see, everything I've drawn on the board has been in, in two dimensions. Right? So, so let me give an example of where you get um, high dimensional data points. So there are these things called um, SIFT vectors, which lie in um, um, R128. So that D equals 128. 28 dimensions. Okay, so so 
Does anyone here work in computer vision or imaging? Is, is, is that your area? Show of, show of hands, no one? One person. Yeah, okay, so, so you've maybe heard of SIF vectors or, okay. So these SIF vectors in computer vision is, is like, uh, they're incredibly useful. So some people don't like them and they're trying to improve them, but they're used in, I, I don't know, some like maybe a, a, a quarter of papers I've seen in computer vision use these SIF vectors. So, okay, so, so let me start by saying um, what is an, uh, what is an image? So, so if you're working in imaging here, you're probably working maybe in stuff in 3D, but in computer vision, you'll take a picture of something and it's, and it's pictures in 2D, and what it looks like is going to be a, um, some, this is a picture, and maybe there's someone's face, you know, and you know, face, and you have some hair on top here, and I'm, I'm a horrible artist. So. <laughs> um, but you have, you have some picture that looks like this, and actually how it's stored is that there's all these pixels, um, I can only draw a certain resolution, but there are actually lots of these pixels, right? So, um, so if you've gotten a camera recently, you have, uh, um, you know, you count the number of pixels in, in uh, um, you count them in, uh, um, you count them in um, gigapixels, right? And uh, so, I forget even how many of it is. It's like billions of pixels, right? Um, so, uh, but if you take it in raw, if you take a picture in raw, it's just going to be the pixels here. If you have a JPEG, it automatically compresses some of the stuff, but it's still pixels at, at the base. And you can reconstruct some set of pixels in it. And so, what is each pixel? Each of these pixels, let's say that this person has blue eyes. I didn't draw them. Let me pretend. So if if this was if the pixels were this resolution, then maybe their eyeballs are just these pixels, and then this pixel would be all blue, right? This is the eyeball blue picture, and the nose is, you know, maybe this person has a has a red nose, and so it's, um, um, this is a picture of Rudolph, right? Um, so, this is, so they have a red nose, and these four pixels are red. Um, it's, it's the whole pixel, right? So a pixel is just one color. And, you know, back when I started college, you could look at a picture, especially on the internet, and you could see all the pixels, right? Now, maybe some people wouldn't believe this, right? But uh, hopefully everyone still believes that as pixels, right? So um, typically how the pixels are stored is just some list of the pixels. You just have an array. And maybe you have, you know, if this is 128 by 128, then you have a, you know, vector of size, you know, 128 times 128, which is some, some large number. And it's, you know, it's, there are some really large number of pixels. Okay. So this is how the data is stored, and maybe you just pretend this is black and white, and so then you just have darker the blacker it is, and whiter here. So each pixel, so in in black and white is is going to be some value, and let's say that this this value is is maybe in. Um, you know, resolution is only up to 256. So there's some gray value where maybe um, one is white and 256 is all black. Maybe I have this backwards, but um, so you get this value between one and 256, right? So, so you have this for each of the pixels, and so this image is some high-dimensional vector. But th this is not what the SIF feature is. People don't treat images this way. This this throws away all the structure of it. So you could think of this as one vector 
of 128 by 128. But, the, but this is not the Sufitian. Maybe, maybe this is some number much bigger than this. Right, okay, so uh, then there was a sub feature. Um, well, it's a way of looking at the structure of the image. So what you do is you look at one of these pixels, and he's a pointy nose, so this will be a, a good example. And you're going to look at um, all the pixels around it. So for one pixel in the middle, it has eight uh, um, neighboring pixels. Right, so let me draw this a, a little bit bigger. So for pixel X, you have N1, N2, N3, N4, N5, N6, N7, N8. Okay, so you have these eight pixels going around here. And uh, so even though these values are normalized, there's, in images there's lots of like, you can have brightening or, or darkening, so you don't want to actually use the absolute value, you want to use the relationship between neighboring pixels. And so if it's a very dark red nose and then a white face, this will be a kind of a sharp corner. And so there's going to be a big difference between this pixel value and this pixel value. And that will pretty much be the same no matter how bright the picture is. So this difference here is going to be very large. So you're going to create, from this pixel, you're going to start by getting a eight-dimensional eight vector, where you have n, let's see, you have x minus n1, and you're, you're finding essentially what is the gradient of, along this direction by doing x minus n2, and so forth, up to x minus n8. And so, so this, is, this is the gradient um, in these directions. And so typically what you do in the SIP feature, and so, so if, if you have read the SIP feature paper, this is one of the most highly cited papers in computer science in the last 15 years. Um, so does anyone know exactly how the SIP feature are, are defined? Um, I think it's uh, 4 by 4 on each of the pixels. Yeah, so th th there's, there's going to be another uh, there's going to be another set of layers you go out to. Um, they do a scale and variance. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll get to the scale and variance next. Yeah. So th the details are all murky in the paper. Um, I tried to read it, and it's clear in the code, but I haven't gone through and read the code which is publicly available. But, um, but I'm not exactly sure exactly how it's defined. But they do something like a gradient. And then they find the value with the largest difference between x and ni. And let's say that this, this difference is the largest. And then they say they're going to reorder these based on the largest value. So the largest value is first. So x7 is first. And they're going to reorder these. So this is now 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So we're going to reorder these. And this is trying to get out the rotation. So if I took a picture here and I turned the camera sideways, this point would still kind of, this, this vector would still be able to be matched because the largest gradient is still going to line up. They may need to do this several times if there are ties. So then they have two features. But let's pretend there's one largest gradient direction. So then I've rewritten this vector into the, um, after I got out the rotation, to be x minus n7, x minus n8, to be x minus n6. So this is supposed to get out the rotation. So the, the scale, it's, it stands for scale and varying feature transform. And so it's supposed to get rid of the, the shift, the rotation, and the scale. Um, but the shift and rotation didn't get in the, in the, in the catchy name for it. Um, the, the, by taking the gradient instead of the absolute value, that's supposed to get rid of shift. This transformation is supposed to get rid of the rotation. And then, um, then what you do is, uh, So instead of just one pixel here that, that we do this at, you take 
one of these pixels, you want this to be true at the same scale. So if you, this picture is like on your, on your ID card, it takes up the whole face. Or if you take kind of a shot with a panorama in the background, this guy is going to be some, some uh, small part of the, of the picture. So you want to get rid of the scale. So you look at this at, at multiple scales here. You don't compute this at one pixel, but you take some point on your, on your image. And so, so instead, you look at, say, a corner here, and you look at different scales at this scale and you look at these four pixels. You also look at something like, uh, I don't know exactly how this is defined. Then you look at this larger scale and you look at something like, um, you treat then this as a super pixel and you do this again, but instead of just the neighboring pixels, you look at the group of a bunch of pixels together do this and this and you do this for um, four um, scales and each is going to give you four um, values and each of these for each of these pixels you're going to compute a vector that looks like this so you're going to get four scales times four um, pixels, and then times each you're going to get um, times eight um, of, of these coordinates. And so you're going to get, so for each of these, for each point in the diagram, you're going to get um, 128 of these um, values. And so for a, a point in the picture, you're going to get a 128 dimensional vector. So, and then you only keep these if you think it's interesting, being that the gradient is really high in, in, a, in a lot of these corrections. So, I, you know, I probably didn't explain this really well, and maybe Eleanor can explain it, explain it better. But th this is the rough, rough idea of what this is doing. You're, you're creating these, these different scales, 